Welcome. My name is Annie Rogers, and on behalf of the Attitude team, I would like to welcome you to today's ADHD Experts broadcast. Uh, today's title is When Teen Stress Ignites Strong Emotions, Teaching Anger and Frustration Management. Um, I don't need to tell you this is a topic of incredible importance and very immediate need. Uh, so many families here are navigating month number 11 uh, without normal school, athletics, activities, social outlets. Teen emotions are understandably uh, uh, heightened. They are already exacerbated by ADHD and puberty and um, Parents need help. So that's why we're here today um, to help understand what's going on and move forward with some practical solutions thanks to the uh, insights of uh, Brendan Mahan. Brendan is an internationally recognized ADHD and executive fun function expert and speaker, and he's the host of the ADHD Essentials podcast. He's a former teacher, a mental health counselor, a principal, and Brendan helps individuals, families, schools, and businesses manage the challenges of ADHD and neurodiversity through an approach that blends education, collaborative problem solving, and accountability. And he does it with compassion, humor, and a focus on strengths and growth. Um, and this is all through his trademark wall of awful model. So we're so pleased to have Brendan here today to help us uh, guide us through this, this um, challenging time. Before I hand the mic over to Brendan, I do need to take care of just a few housekeeping items. So if you're tuned into the live webinar, you can download the slides now by clicking on the event resources section of the webinar screen. If you're interested in the certificate of attendance option, please just look out for instructions that will come in an email about an hour after we wrap up. Uh, and if you're listening in replay or podcast mode, just visit attitudemag.com, search podcast 342, and there you'll find the slides, uh, replay certificate of attendance options. Finally, if you support what we do here at Attitude to build and bolster the ADHD community, I encourage you to visit attitudemag.com slash subscribe and consider getting the magazine for your family, your child's teacher, or someone else who could use the support. So without any further ado, I am so pleased to welcome Brendan Mahan here to present to us about teen stress igniting strong emotions. Thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm excited to be here. Um, so we're going to talk about stress and anxiety and strong emotions and frustration and all that kind of fun stuff. So yay, I guess. Um, I know my kids are 12, so they're flirting with teenagerhood. They turned 12 about a week ago. Um, but even as young adolescents, they're certainly struggling with stress and, and anxiety and all of those things. Before we jump into sort of the more complicated strategies and stuff, I just want to give an overview of the difference between like no stress, new stress, and distress. No stress is when like nothing's going on, right? Nothing is being asked of us. And if that goes on long enough, we become apathetic. If it's only going on for a little while, we might be bored. Um, and it's not that great. Like it can kind of eventually lead to its own level of stress. But no stress is, is not necessarily perfection. It's not necessarily where we want to be. New stress is really where we want to be. New stress is healthy stress. It's what improves our performance. It what, it's what helps us focus and attend and care about what we're doing. So right now, I am experiencing new stress, right? There are 2,078 people in this room right now, this virtual room. I am presenting for Attitude Magazine. I want to do a good job for all of you. I want Attitude to be like, that guy did a good job. We want to invite him back. And those of you in the audience, I want all of you to go, that guy did a good job. I appreciate his thoughts and his ideas. I want to listen to his podcast. I want to work with him. I want to join his parent coaching groups, that sort of thing, right? I want to be successful here. So I'm really in you stress. I'm in that period of improved performance. Distress is when we're just overwhelmed by the anxiety, by the stress. It leads to fatigue. It leads to anxiety. It shuts us down. 
And it can, that fatigue can sometimes look like and feel like apathy or boredom, but really it's that we're overwhelmed and burnt out by what is being asked of us as opposed to not having enough being asked of us. And it's a little bit tricky right now with our kids because I don't know about the rest of you, but stuff that I was asking of my kids a year ago is burning them out now. Like they've sort of regressed a little bit and stuff that used to be really easy for them to do, all of a sudden there's times when it's more than they can handle. And it depends. Sometimes that's literally like pouring milk, right? And and I don't mean to belittle my kids either because sometimes them asking me to pour them pour them milk is overwhelming for me cuz I'm riding the line so tightly just like they are. And so we kind of have to be considerate of all of us, our kids, ourselves, our spouses, anyone in the house. Um in terms of where are we and what what do, what are our needs? So when it comes to ADHD, anxiety, and age, and how that affects teen emotions, a study from 2015 out of the Journal of Child Development, um, it looked at a, the emotional variability in teenagers. Like, and variability just means like up and down, right? Like how strong they are or less strong. So we're looking at 13 to 18, happiness, anger, and sadness declined in variability continually throughout adolescence. So those sort of high spikes and high lows and, and that kind of stuff became those, those roller coaster moments became less significant. Anxiety, on the other hand, increased at first. So early on, right, 12, 13, 14, it increases. Then it starts to fall off and become more balanced. That roller coaster becomes less intense. But then it increased again toward late adolescence. And, and some of this is developmental. Some of this is just the nature of life, right? Like late adolescence, 17, 18, you're starting to think about the rest of your life. You're starting to think about college. All of that stuff is going to increase anxiety as well as just brain development. So we want to be aware of situational experiences and the roles that those are going to play in our kids' anxiety and how variable it is. So the good news is that overall emotions become more stable. I guess, as we get older, that variability reduces, um, but life experience can influence what that looks like. And right now, all of us are living through a pretty significant life experience, really a global trauma event with COVID and social distancing and the isolation that's coming with it and, and the uncertainty of all of this. It's making things much more difficult for us, which is making things more difficult for our kids. And I really want to honor that throughout this workshop. Um, some emotional challenges that come with ADHD specifically. So now we're moving out of age and into ADHD. First, ADHD is a, is a developmental disorder. So those younger variability, older ADHD kids are still going to have that variability. We typically experience emotions more strongly. There is general emotional dysregulation that comes with ADHD, right? ADHD folks just struggle to adapt their emotional intensity to the situation. Often they're more intense than they need to be because we have difficulty reining that in. Um, and that emotional intensity, right, it can look like a few different things, right? Sometimes people with ADHD just experience these emotions more intensely. Teens especially experience emotions more intensely. <clears throat> Excuse me. So when we combine those two things together, we have really strong emotions. Also, folks with ADHD have difficulty recognizing and identifying the emotions that they're experiencing, both themselves and in other people. So we might, and I say we because I have ADHD, we might see someone and have difficulty registering whether they're sad or angry, or are they frustrated or angry? I know my kids are having trouble with that right now. They typically just think that if I am frustrated or my wife is frustrated, that we're mad at them even if it, if it has nothing to do with them. And, and that's, some of that's the sensitivity of COVID. Some of that is the sensitivity that goes with ADHD and goes with executive function challenges. So all of that is coming up in your houses, I'm sure. Um, and there's also this idea of emotional lability, which is rapid, often exaggerated change in mood, right? So strong emotions and feelings, like uncontrollable laughing or crying, or really strong irritability or temper. And, and it can come expressed through behaviors that seem exaggerated in comparison to the situation, right? You might ask your kid to, to pour themselves some milk and they're like, you don't love me. It's like, I just don't want to pour you milk, kid. Like what? Settle down. 
that's not what's happening here. Um, and we want to respond to those in ways that are more soothing, more comforting, helping them to calm themselves down. If we spike along with them, it's not going to be helpful. So even if we think, settle down, kid, this isn't a big deal, we don't necessarily want to say that. We want to validate what they're going through, but also try to help de-escalate them. We'll get into that in a couple of minutes. And also just there's some general irritableness that comes with ADHD, like just negative feelings and, and general anger and often displaced anger and, and those sorts of things. That's going to come with ADHD, but that's also going to come with heightened anxiety. And, and so the heightened anxiety of COVID is really what we're looking at combining with ADHD to make things, you know, extra difficult. Yay. <laughs> um, so, so how does, is stress going to appear during COVID? What might it look like? We might see some resistance, right? I don't want to clean my room. It's stupid. It doesn't matter. Why should I? Um, we might see some tiredness, some exhaustion, too tired to walk the dog, too tired to do the dishes. And this is not just in our kids. This is in us too, right? I know there's times when I'm like, I don't really want to do those dishes. I'm not dealing with it. I'll do it in the morning. Um, there's apathy that's coming for a lot of us. Like, why should I do my school work? School doesn't matter anyway. And a piece of that is just this existential dread of COVID, right? Like, how is this going to look in the future? Is there a future? Where are we with all this stuff? Am I safe? Is my future assured? What if I get COVID and I don't live through it? So. There's a lot of apathy, particularly aimed at the future, which is playing out in schools for some kids and for some teens and folks in college and even, even people who are full-grown adults going to work. It's normal. It doesn't mean we want to lean into it. It doesn't mean we want to like let that apathy continue. We want to push against it, try to work through it, but it's there. And so too is boredom. Like Everything is boring right now because everything is kind of the same in a lot of ways. I really encourage you to try to vary your kids' experiences as much as you can. With my guys, I have identical twin sons who are 12 years old. I try to get them on an adventure at least once a week. And recently we had like three or four weeks in a row where I just was not able to pull that off. Um, and I knew it. <laughs> like, man, I could tell. Bedtime was a lot harder. Getting them to cooperate was a lot harder because it was just the same every day day in, day out. They didn't have enough stimulation. They weren't trying to be jerks, but that, that upsetness, that anxiety of, of tediousness was there. Um, and, and also recognize that when your kid says they're bored, sometimes that's code for sadness. And it's completely appropriate to be feeling sad right now during COVID. And we want to recognize those emotions and help your kids identify those emotions so that they're naming the right emotion and we're using the right interventions. There's a lot of need for comfort right now um, and connection. And, and so I, I highly recommend providing that with your, to your kids. And then we've got displaced anger and frustration, right? I hate skiing. I don't want to go. Speaking of adventures, skiing is my go-to winter adventure. And, and there's times when even in the middle of skiing, my kids suddenly don't want to be there anymore. And it's just anxiety about going home and anxiety about getting to bed on time. It took me a while to figure that out. But one of my kids starts getting anxious after lunch, and it's because there's another two-hour drive home. And then am I going to get to bed on time? Is my brother going to go be able to go to bed? Because sometimes his brother struggles to get to sleep. And all of that anxiety was leading to him feeling angry and frustrated about bedtime, which we weren't even there yet. It's like 1230, and he's already starting to worry about that. And that's the stress of COVID. Um, and then there's also that numbing out stuff with COVID, right? Like, can I have 20 more minutes on my iPad? I just want to play this video game. I'm just going to watch this, I don't know, YouTube video or whatever. That numbing out, some of that's trying to find some variability if every day is the same, and some of that is trying to escape the tediousness and the difficulty of COVID. We have to come up with options for that. If your kid is spending too much time on screens, you have to give them a better option. If you don't give them a better option, then they're going to keep looking at the screen. That's where adventures come in. That's where board games and connection and that kind of stuff is going to come in. Start sharing your passions with them. See if it gets them off the screens for a little while. So ways to identify dysregulated emotions, right? First off, dysregulated is dysregulated regardless of the emotion. And by dysregulated, I just mean not in control, right? Our emotions are not controlled. A lot of times kids are like happy and running around the house 
and then all of a sudden they snap and start yelling and screaming and they're the worst mom or they're the worst dad or I hate you or they start crying. This is so terrible. I can never do my homework. I can't believe that I'm such a bad kid or whatever. And it, they seem to flip on a dime, right? They go from happy to sad or they go from happy to mad. And we really want emotions to be binary as humans. Like we often think of like sad is the opposite of happy, right? But also mad is the opposite of happy. And, and that's not how opposites work. So that can't be the case. So if you're a person who really likes for your emotions to feel binary, this is how you make opposites in emotions. They're either regulated or they're dysregulated, and that's all there is to it. So if a kid is really happy and excited, and then all of a sudden they're crying or yelling and screaming, they were already dysregulated. They were just dysregulated in a happy, positive way, and that doesn't feel threatening or upsetting. So we're more comfortable with our kids being happy in a like giggly, silly, running around the house, laughing uncontrollably way. And we don't recognize that that's dysregulated so that when they go into dysregulated, sad or mad or whatever, we don't see that that shift happened. We try to figure out how they go from happy to sad. And really all they did was went from dysregulated to dysregulated. So whatever emotion was there boiled to the surface and came out. So start paying attention to if your kid is under control emotionally or not under control and then help them regulate. And yes, we'll get to that. First, you want to get to know their baseline, right? What, is, what are your kid's baseline emotional status? so that you can start finding deviations from the norm. Your kid's baseline is different from my kid's baseline and it's different from Sally's kid's baseline. So pay attention to, are they moving more than usual? Are they more fidgety? Are they pacing more? Is there more hand wringing? Are they having larger expressions of emotions, right? Yelling, bigger physical gestures, hiding in the room or under a blanket, grabbing your arm for emphasis, swearing, all of those things are indications that perhaps they are becoming more dysregulated. But again, if your kid already tends to grab your arm a lot when they talk to you, that doesn't necessarily mean they're dysregulated. That just means they're physical in their communication. It's when they're grabbing more or tighter or something like that, then we're having some dysregulation clues, not a guarantee. Also, are their emotions just uncontrolled in general? Are they laughing hysterically? Are they crying hysterically? Are they punching things? That tells us that these emotions are not managed so well. And sometimes there's smaller gestures too, right? The kid that flips their hood up, that's a pretty good clue that they're trying to wall people off. They're trying to keep away. Um, if they ask or tell you to stop doing something, that's a pretty good clue that you're starting to ramp them up or whatever's happening is starting to ramp them up. It might not be you specifically. Respect that, right? If they shut down or stonewall you, they're trying to prevent themselves from becoming dysregulated. That's why they stonewall. They're trying to keep this emotion in check because they know they're feeling threatened or, or angry or whatever. And if they engage, they're going to snap and start yelling, and that's going to make things worse. So they're stonewalling to try to keep it in control, keep it in check. When you get those signals from your kids, respect them. It's okay to leave the conversation and come back, right? Just say, it seems like you're getting overwhelmed. Why don't we come back to this conversation in a half an hour or tomorrow morning or whatever makes appropriate sense. And so from there... We want to look at some assumptions that aid communication, which is sort of where we're heading now, right? First of all, fundamental assumptions. These are not easy. They're just, but they still need to form your foundation as much as you can do that. Start building these in, in there. Everybody is doing the best they can. Your kids are doing the best they can. You're doing the best they can. If someone is not doing it well enough, it's not because they don't want to. It's because they lack skills. So if your kid is not getting their homework done, there's a skill missing. What's the skill set that's missing? It might be trigonometry. They might not understand it. That's possible. But the skill could also be something that seems a little more ethereal, like maybe they're just bad at starting and they need some support in getting started, right? I'm a big fan of like, can you start my orange, right? Like there's that kid who they can they'll peel the orange, but you got to kind of rip it first and then they'll take over. Your kid might need you to start their orange. It doesn't mean they have, you have to do their trigonometry homework. It means you have to get them to the point where they can do question number one. Just support them in doing question number one and then move on. Also, we're all on the same team. That's critical. It's a critical perspective. It's not you versus the kid. It's not your kid versus you. It's you and your kid versus whatever the challenge is. We want... We want to be sitting on the same side of the table with the problem on the table in front of us. We don't want 
our kid on one side of the table and us on the other side of the table and the problem in the middle. We want to avoid that. We want to be on the same side, looking at the problem together, trying to figure out how to crack it. How do we clean the room? How do we do trigonometry homework? How do we find an adventure to go on that we can all enjoy so that we can get out of the house a little bit? It, also, it's not personal. Like, it's not personal. And if, if you feel like your interactions with your kid is personal, if you feel like your kid is trying to upset you and bother you and that sort of thing, you have to fix that as mom and dad. I have to fix that as dad when I'm in that spot because I have all the power and so do you. As parents, we have the power. And I'm a big fan of punching up. I'm not blaming the kid. I'm blaming the parent, me included, when this happens for me. We have to help fix the relationship. We have to make the apologies. We have to make the bids to get the kid reconnected. And they might reject it the first few times. We have to keep trying because they do want to be connected to us. They do want us to care about them. They do want us to love them. They want that relationship to be there. Even your 15-year-old kid who wants nothing more than to get away from you, because they're supposed to, it's developmentally appropriate. They still want you there. Like they just want you to be plan B or plan C. And we have to be comfortable with being plan B or plan C because plan A and plan B are going to fall apart at some point. And right now plan A is kind of dead in the water thanks to COVID and they're stuck with us and it's driving them nuts. And that's okay. Imagine if you were 15 and you were stuck in house with your kid, with your parents all the time. Sure. You would have hated it too. Um, I know I would have. And then finally, like, I love you. Just, when you're banging your head against your kid, the wall that is your kid, like, just stop and think, I love you, and maybe say it out loud to them, no matter how hard they're being, no matter how bad it's going. It helps us reset and reframe our, our approach. And then some emotional versus cognitive communication. I really want to play with this a little bit. This is kind of a new thing that I'm messing with. <clears throat> um, Conflict typically arises because one or more of the people in the interaction are communicating from an emotional place as opposed to like a logical cognitive place. And emotional communication is totally valid, but if one of us is cognitive and one of us is emotional, we start to have some problems because we're, we're just not on the same wavelength. And emotional, emotionality in communication can be challenging. So first, are you communicating from an emotional place or a cognitive place? Where are you? And what about the other person, right? Try to figure out where they are. And I'm going to give you some hints on how to do that. But start with that question. Like, just wonder, where are we both communicating from? Are we cognitive or emotional? What's going on? The closer you are to a topic and the more it affects you, the more likely you are to be communicating from an emotional standpoint. And, and a good example of this is it's really easy for people to joke around like, oh, I'm sorry, I have ADHD. I forgot to do that. And when people who don't have ADHD turn ADHD into a joke, a lot of us get upset by that because we're really close to ADHD and we know how painful and traumatic and disruptive this disorder is. So when other people joke about having it when they don't, it can irritate us. That's what I mean by the closer you are to a topic, the more it affects you, the more likely you are to end up in an emotional spot when communicating about it. Often that emotional spot is one of passion, frustration, offense, Anger, that can be there. And sometimes it's excitement and joy. That happens too. Often excitement and joy emotions do not cause as much trouble in communication. It's the negative ones that get more challenging. Um, and again, communicating from an emotional place is totally valid. It just isn't always helpful. It's not always going to help us get to where we want to be. So we want to help the person we're talking to get out of a communication that is more emotion-based and into communication that is more logic and problem solving based. And if we're the ones in an emotional place, we want to try to get ourselves out of that emotional spot and into a more cognitive spot. So how do we do that? Um, first, let's look at how to identify things. Cognitive communication is likely to be focused on details, facts, and problem solving. That's the good part. but it can also be focused on winning the argument rather than learning or addressing the problem at hand. Like that can happen too. It can just be like, oh, I'm going to make my point and they're going to learn. Like that stuff is not so helpful. That's when a little bit of emotional is bleeding into it. And usually it's in the form of competitiveness. Emotional communication is more likely to focus on feelings as opposed to facts. 
it's more often looking to seek validation and connection and all of that stuff is pretty good. But it can also become defensive and then get caught up in emotional storms and escalate things as a result. So if I'm focusing on your feelings and I'm trying to help navigate that, that's good. But if your feelings escalate and then my feelings escalate and now we're in this storm, that's not so helpful. So those are just two sort of good things about cognitive and emotional communication and two potential pitfalls to be mindful of. When we have a cognitive communicator, um, they can feel dismissive and aloof and even overwhelming to an emotional communicator because they're not validating feelings potentially. They're not tuned into this person's emotions. And they're also maybe just throwing fact after fact after fact after fact at them that the emotional communicator doesn't care about and isn't, isn't focused on. And an emotional communicator can feel sometimes passive or disconnected or defensive if they're sort of in that part of the more emotional world. And if they're in a more energetic emotional world, they can feel aggressive and overwhelming to the cognitive communicator, um, depending on sort of where in the spectrum of emotion the emotional communicator lands. So again, fact-focused, analysis-focused, problem-solving-focused, that's your cognitive communicator. Those are indications that you're probably in a cognitive place. Swearing, defensiveness, shutting down, aggression, that's probably more emotional communication. Being aware of your own emotional state when you're communicating and trying to manage it can help. And if appropriate, name your emotions and the reasons you're feeling them to yourself and the person you're communicating with and to your kid. And by the way, an emotion that you're probably feeling that you might not be recognizing or willing to say is you are often feeling scared for your kid because are they going to pass 11th grade? Are they going to handle all of the challenges that are in the future because they're really struggling right now during COVID? And, and it's valid for you to be scared for your kid. It's valid for you to be worried. They're going to be okay. We're going to get through this COVID stuff and things are going to get easier. And hopefully we see a lot of post-traumatic growth out of our kids, which is just after the trauma, you get stronger because this trauma is, is conditioning them. It's strengthening them. It's tempering them, this global pandemic. They don't have to come out of this weaker. They can come out of it stronger. So to some degree, we need to manage our own emotions and worries about our kids' future based on what's happening now so that we can help them get to where they need to be. Continuing on with this emotional and cognitive communication, we can help the emotional communicator move out of emotional communication and into cognitive communication so that the battles reduce. That starts with validating their emotions. Like you seem sad, you seem angry, you seem frustrated. I've, I've shut down whole rants from people. I did, I did it with my wife yesterday. She was talking about a thing at work that was driving her crazy. And she was like, she had a head of steam going, man. And I said, that sounds frustrating. And she was like, yeah, it is frustrating. And, and her head of steam just died. It just was over because she didn't have to demonstrate it to me anymore. I recognized it. I, meant, I, I validated it. She felt validated. She felt heard. And now she was able to shift gears into something else. We still stayed on that topic, but she wasn't as, as aggressive about it because she knew I understood how she was feeling. And then she shifted to more of the cognitive. These are the specific things that are, that are in, happening in this issue that I need to address. Reflective listening is also good. Reflective listening is when you just kind of say back to them what they said to you with some tweaks, like you don't want to sound like a parrot. But if your kid is like, I hate my teacher. She doesn't understand. She just always gives me homework and doesn't even care about the fact that I can't focus on virtual teach virtual school. And you say like, okay, so it sounds like you don't like your teacher because she's not understanding that you're having trouble with virtual schooling. Yeah, that kind of thing. Like summarize it. Repeat back to them what they said in summary and maybe use some different words, but the same idea. Or maybe use the same words. Also, taking a walk is a great way to get out of communication, emotional communication. Like just go somewhere. Potentially together. It doesn't mean you have to leave the conversation and go away, although that's a good way to manage your own anxiety. But sometimes having a hard conversation while walking in the woods or down the street or in the neighborhood can help us get to a better place partially because we're out in public and we only want to get so elevated emotionally, but also because we're moving our bodies and heading in the same direction and it feels like we're a team 
a little more because we're going in the same direction. And like I mentioned, if you need to take a break and take a walk, do it. If you have to take a break from the conversation, take that break, but make sure you go back to the conversation later and make a plan to go back to that conversation before you leave it so that the other person knows that you care about the conversation and you're validating the importance of it. Um, <clears throat> and also gestures of comfort and forgiveness and acceptance, that stuff's important too, right? Like if, you're, if your kid's really struggling, and, and I'll use a personal example, my kid was going through some hard times, just mostly getting to bed and anxiety around tomorrow's going to be the same day and, and this is hard and that sort of thing. And, and my kids love banana bread. So I just made banana bread one night and it, it helped one of my kids get their teeth brushed faster because they wanted to have the banana bread right before bed. That's like a loving gesture for them. Um, it helped them kind of navigate all that bedtime stuff quicker. And I know they brushed their teeth and then ate banana bread and like that kind of ruins the whole toothbrushing thing, but don't tell them because the banana bread matters more. Um, but those gestures of comfort and forgiveness and acceptance are important, right? Make space on the couch, make them a hot chocolate, make them banana bread, take them for a trip to the store or whatever makes sense. And then also just in general, being overwhelmed and feeling overwhelmed, right? Help them not to not feel overwhelmed, help reduce that overwhelm so that they can move out of emotional communication. And, and sometimes overwhelming them, and I don't recommend this, but it, you know your kid. Sometimes if you just like push them a little further, it can bring them back around. I know I have to do that with my kids sometimes. There's times when I have to like, like put a little vase and bass in my voice and be like, like, are we going to have an issue? <laughs> like, am I going to have to like be cranky and be upset about this? And they're like, no. And that kind of like snaps them back to reality and helps them settle down. I don't necessarily recommend this as the first option ever. This is like the last choice, but it is a, it is a strategy that sometimes is needed. So anxiety. This slide is my perspective on anxiety. I use it with my clients all the time. It comes up in the parent coaching groups. Every single time we do it, it's, there's always a week on anxiety and how to manage it. Um, it's critical to recognize that anxiety goes up and it comes back down again. And that stress goes up and comes back down again. We have to be able to get out of the anxiety. So we like to think that we start with no anxiety, but none of us are there. All of us are starting closer to just ang anxious, if not actually anxious, every day. Job stuff moves your baseline anxiety up from zero to one or two, right? Having a kid with special needs, having a kid with ADHD, dyslexia, oppositional defiance disorder, that stuff is going to raise your baseline anxiety up a little bit. Living through a global pandemic, that's going to raise your anxiety up a little bit. So all of us are probably somewhere at like a four or a five in terms of out of 10. Like we're all up there a little bit. And some of us are a little higher. Some of us may be a little lower. But we're all that much closer to fight, flight, and freeze, right, to yelling, to being angry, to wanting to go hide, to, to just not knowing what to do and getting stuck and frozen. We're all there. And so recognize that. Like there's fine, which is sort of that lower tier, one through five. Six, seven, eight-ish is when the kids start to fib. They tell little lies to try to de-escalate the anxiety at home. Sometimes the adults do this too. Are they trying to get away with stuff? Yeah, yeah, they are. But they're also trying to manage anxiety by changing reality. It doesn't always work. Then the fight, flight, and freeze hits around that eight and a half, nine, ten land depending on the level of intensity. Fight, flight, and freeze is about trying to find safety, trying to feel safe, trying to protect yourself. So if your kid is like yelling and arguing and fighting, they're trying to feel safe. They're not trying to be disrespectful. They're trying to get out of that stressed out level. And so recognize that that's under there somewhere and reapproach it, change your, change your strategy. And then on the way back down, what's critical is this, this initial part of forgiveness. When our kids spike, we have to forgive them for whatever that mistake is, whatever that error is, before we try to get them to fix it. Because oftentimes, if the kid had the skills to fix the problem, they would have avoided the problem in the first place. They don't have the skills to fix it because they didn't have the skills to avoid it. And the person that they're most likely to get help from 
in fixing that problem is us. But they're not going to ask us for help if we haven't reconnected with them, if we haven't forgiven them, if we haven't made it clear that we still love them, they just screwed up and it's not the end of the world. So when your kid messes up, forgive them, whatever that looks like, whether it's banana bread or making them hot co- hot chocolate or, I don't know, buying them a Lego set or letting them go hang out with their friends, whatever that looks like, do that forgiveness and say it also, like use those words. Hey, it's not a big deal. I forgive you. Especially if you have a kid who says, I'm sorry all the time, which a fair number of my clients have kids doing that right now. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Instead of saying, don't worry about it, say, hey, I forgive you. And also you should forgive you because most of those sorries are aimed at themselves. And then after that forgiveness and that reconnection, then move into fixing. Otherwise, the, the forgiveness and the reconnection feels contingent on them fixing the problem, which they're not prepared to do because they probably don't have the skills to do it. So how do we de-escalate anxiety in the moment? Take a break, like I said. Connect with other people, right? Visit family, call and text a friend, talk to a counselor, that stuff. This doesn't have to be an, an argument, just I'm generally feeling anxious. Connect to people. Exercise, that's great for in the moment and long-term stuff. So is connection. Do the hard thing. Like just get in that mindset of I'm going to do the hard thing even though it's hard because then it gets easier. Like once you've done the hard thing and it didn't kill you, the anxiety usually diminishes. Find things that are comforting, right? Snuggling under a blanket, a favorite stuffed animal, a hug from a friend, a delicious snack. Escapism is valid as long as it's temporary, right? So reading a book, watching a television show, playing a video game, and anchors, stuffed animals, a pet, a talisman, those kinds of things. All of that can help us de-escalate. Even just a worry stone is valid. In the big picture, we want to take care of our physical needs to keep our anxiety managed, right? Get enough sleep, eat a healthy diet, exercise more, those sorts of things. Stuff that is hard during COVID, but if you can pick one and start doing it, other things will become easier. Accept your anxiety and make friends with it. Like, hey, my anxiety is just hanging out on my shoulder. His name's Zach, and he drives me crazy, but he's there. Thank you for your input, Zach. I don't need to worry about that thing. I'm going to go do this. You can sort of depersonalize it by giving your anxiety a name and pretending it's hanging out with you and be making it your friend that just wants to protect you but doesn't always know how to do it. Confront the thing that's making you anxious and do it anyway, kind of like I said earlier, right? Do the hard thing. Lean into your fears you'll learn that they're not going to kill you. And that makes things more manageable in the long run. And connected to that is learning how to be uncomfortable. If we can learn how to be uncomfortable, we can do things while we're uncomfortable. We can do hard things. And then building skill sets, things that we can feel proud of, things that make us feel accomplished, that's critical. Kids that play a sport, kids that do the arts and have like skills with the trumpet or painting Those skill sets help those kids feel accomplished, and that gives them something they can stand on as a platform to support themselves. We can manage other people's anxieties by finding out what their de-escalation strategies are and encouraging them to use them. A bunch of those I just named earlier. Naming and validating their emotions, as I mentioned before. Be as consistent as you can in, in your expectations, in the way you talk to your kids. Consistency breeds like safety because I know what to expect. Set clear and appropriate expectations for your kids with that reduction in, in age developmentally for your for your kid with ADHD. So your 16-year-old might really be performing at the level of a 14-year-old and that's okay. That's what IEPs and 504s are all about. Um, celebrate their accomplishments when they do something well. Celebrate that and support them in doing the hard thing when, when that becomes necessary. And then finally, protect your kids from unnecessary anxiety. And and what I mean by that is like, turn off the news because there's nothing good about the news. It's only designed to make you anxious. I have way too many clients who have the TV on 24 hours a day. And usually it's tuned to the news as though that's somehow informing them. And it's just making their kids anxious. And sometimes I've talked to kids who thought that like really tragic stuff happened three days in a row because the news kept showing it again and again, and they weren't realizing it was the same thing from three days ago. So kill the news. Um, And stay out of earshot if you're having grown-up conversations about how scary the world is or how much your kids are driving you nuts or or putting them into uncomfortable spots where you're criticizing family members or something like that. Like, get out of there. They don't need to overhear that. 
And I recognize that's hard during COVID because you're all in the same house, but, but it's your job to figure out how to have those conversations somewhere else. Go for a walk, hop in your car and drive around the blocks. Your kids can't hear you. Whatever needs to happen. Run a fake errand with your spouse. Um, and then also when they mess up, if they get it that they messed up and they feel bad about it already, you don't need to make that worse. You don't need to like hammer that home. And I, I fall into that pattern sometimes myself, and I always beat myself up for it afterwards. It might be why I sometimes beat myself kids up for when they, not literally, but why I give my kids grief for m- making a mistake because I make, give myself grief. And I, I'm working on breaking that pattern, and I, I'm doing a lot better than I have in the past. Um, but, but that's another way to get rid of the unnecessary anxiety. They get it, they messed up, move on. Uh, and all of that said, uh, there are questions. Uh, you can enter your, your questions in the box to the left, and I will happily answer them for the remaining however many minutes. And I think I'm going to have a co-host jump on and yes. start saying stuff. So I'll be quiet. <laughs> yes. This is Annie. I'm here. Um, yes, sorry. We have been getting many, many questions. That was a, a fantastic uh, presentation and a lot of comments of thanks for the ideas you've already shared and for uh, the understanding. So someone said here that your children are very lucky that you understand their brains. And I think that is one of the nicest compliments I've ever heard. So, <laughs> um, so I will get right into it. We have a lot of parents joining us today who also have ADHD. And Mm -hmm. they have questions about how do you, as one person said, how do you stop from lighting each other's fuses? Yeah. (laughs) Um, I'm going to punch up. You'll see that I do that consistently. Um, It's your job to not light your kid's fuse. And it's your job to not let your fuse get lit when your kids try to light it. You just got to make your fuse soggy. That's all there is to it. And I recognize that's hard, right? Your kids can push your buttons because they put most of those buttons there. I totally follow. But as parents, we have to recognize that. We have to, we have to try to pay attention to when are our fuses getting lit? Is there a pattern in there somewhere? And if there is, when you enter into that situations that are going to cause that pattern to get triggered, recognize it. So like if you tend to, your fuse gets lit at bedtime, which is a really common time for fuses to get lit, that means that you need to prep yourself five minutes before bedtime to be more calm. And that might mean that you're meditating. That might mean that you're doing some jumping jacks or push-ups. That might mean you're going for a walk. That might mean you're talking to yourself about how I'm, you're going to stay calm this time, Sally. Like you're going to be chill. This time you're going to be chill. Like Gertrude is going to say this, this, and this, and you're going to want to like throw her out the window, but remember the last time when the snow wasn't as deep as you thought and then hurt like do that right like and don't throw your kid out the window even if there's snow out there um there's jokes but like you kind of have to prep prep in advance to keep your your fuse from getting lit and then don't light your kid and if your kid does light your fuse try to call them out on it in a very nice way so it, it's okay to say something like oh hey no i get it you said that because i always freak out when you say that and you want me to freak out well, I'm not gonna like that kind of a thing, like really spelling it out, making it transparent. That can be useful too. Um, because it usually throws the kid off and, and sometimes they're trying to push your buttons to get out of the situation, to get out of that conversation. Sometimes they're trying to push your buttons to check if you really love them or not. Mm -hmm. Um, so just love them and don't let them get out of the situation. Right. I think this is, uh, very useful. We had a number of people who said that, you know, their team may say, I hate you, leave me alone, shut mm-hmm. up, you're stupid. Um, and that they read that as, as disrespect, which really bothers them. And I think this goes back mm-hmm. to your point of don't take it personally. I mean, when you have yeah. ADHD yourself, right, it's a matter of recognizing uh, that emotional dysregulation, which is mm, not easy. Right. Um, and, and, and they're not... It, it's not disrespect. They're trying to get out of the situation. That's what's happening, right? So if, if your kid says, I hate you, or says, like, you're stupid, right? Be offended. Don't be angry. Like, when you get mad, you're giving them the power. 
because they got you, right? But if you get offended, and this is easier with video because there's like faces that I need to make for you to get it. But if you can be like, what? That seems, no, really? Like, just be offended. Like, get get a little bit of that hip hop swagger going and, and like, what? Like, be offended. Don't be angry. And stop. Like, the whole conversation should stop. If your kid is like, I hate you or you're stupid, you should, your whole affect should change. You should get calmer. You should get that little low boil offense going. And you should be like, that, that is unacceptable. It's not how you speak to me. That's not how things work in this family. I'm not going to tell you that I hate you, and I'm not going to call you stupid, so I don't expect you to do that to me. Mm. No, I, I'm happy to continue to have this conversation, but we're not having it like that. Can you feel how, like, the vibe of the room changed when I did that just now? Like, yes. there's people in the audience who felt like they were in trouble. <laughs> and, you know what I mean? Like, that's what you have to do. You have to do that little bit of playfulness, like, like you're in a play, like you're on stage. You have to be able to do that. And because they have to know that's not okay. But if you are a parent who calls your kid stupid or tells your kid you hate them, you're doing it wrong. And this is not going to work because you don't have a leg to stand on because they're using the language that you use. So too bad. That's why they're doing it. But if that's not a thing that you do, then call them out on it. And I assume this, this goes for cursing. We've got some questions about that. I love cursing. I just did a podcast on cursing yesterday. Um, and I've done podcast episodes. It wasn't mine, but I've done, there's an episode on cursing in my podcast that I posted a little while ago. Um, cursing is an indication of your kid be, is being in an emotional state or you being in an emotional state. Cursing is valid language. We use it all the time. So if your kid curses too much, you have to teach them how to curse better, right? If, if For real, I've taught my kids how to curse. If you write an essay, I used to be an English teacher. That's going to become clear in a second. Um, this is my English teacher lesson. If you write an essay and every sentence ends with an exclamation point, you look like you don't know how to write, like it reflects poorly upon you. But if you have one exclamation point in that essay, that's a powerful exclamation point. That's kind of cursing, right? Like if you curse all the time, it's not reflecting well on your skills with language but and communication. But if you curse like infrequently, that curse becomes really powerful, that random F-bomb or something. And kids curse at their parents to try to get out of the situation. They're trying to escalate you. They're trying to make you upset. They're trying to piss you off so that you will let them go hide in their room because you think that you won. And you're like, go to your room. And they're like, cool. I'm going to go to my room and get out of this situation and not have to address the deeper issue that is being hidden by the cursing and the swearing and the yelling and the anger. Like you've got you've to recognize that all of that stuff is surface nonsense. And there's a deeper problem underneath that we have to get to. And that's why we want to manage the volatility so we can get to the stuff that's hiding under that volatility. And the stuff underneath the volatility and the anger and the aggression is really, really, really scary for your kid because those are all vulnerable emotions. They're scared. They feel lonely. They feel rejected. They feel overwhelmed. They feel doomed. They have like existential dread for their future because does it even matter? Am I even going to live to be 15 when there's a global pandemic? Like there's deeper, harder stuff hiding underneath that anger. And so you got to get through the anger, but you also have to be ready for that deeper, harder stuff. And that might mean you're getting some mental health clinicians on board or something like that. But there's deeper, harder stuff that they're trying to like scare you away by being a porcupine. Mm -hmm. Now, there are a lot of questions sort of on the... Um... I don't want to say the flip side, but another angle on this, um, mm -hmm. a couple of people who say their kid will uh, either uh, yell at them and then go lock themselves in their room and be and wall themselves off, become inaccessible, mm -hmm. inaccessible. Or uh, others who are saying they'll they'll ask their you know they'll try to engage their child in conversation, see how they're doing, check in on their mental health, and they just get nothing. They say, "I'm fine, mm -hmm. fine, I'm fine." <laughs> Cool. The parents want to help. They want to be there. They feel like they're being shut out. What, what are mm -hmm. your thoughts? <laughs> Stop asking your kids questions when that's the only thing you're doing. Like, I don't get good answers from my kids when the only thing I say is, are you, how are you feeling? How are you doing? Like, I don't get good answers from that. And I still do it, but I don't get good answers. But if my kids and I go skiing or go for a walk or I drive with them to the store or we play a board game, 
or we have a snowball fight because there's 18 inches of snow outside right now. Like when we're doing that stuff, when we're connecting at a level that is close and connected and playful and silly and, and like, like full house kind of stuff, like when that's happening, like, like the stuff that happens in the beginning of a sitcom, when we're doing those activities, then I get more mileage out of my questions later. And sometimes I get those questions during those activities, right? Like if we're driving two hours to a ski mountain, for example, it gets boring. Like we're going to have a good conversation at some point. And sometimes that conversation starts with talking about what skiing was like or playing a car game. Like we just find all the Virginia license plates or whatever. If you play a game about noticing things, then the kid can turn and start talking about other stuff. And that's, that is useful. And the other thing is ask weirder questions, right? Like don't ask, Hey, how's it going with your friends? Say like, if you were locked in the mall with one of your friends, which of your friends do you want to be locked in the mall with? Uh, this one. Okay, cool. How come? Now we're getting some interesting information about that kid. And that might go somewhere useful because it's such a bizarre question. So try that kind of stuff too. And if right. you're locking yourselves in the room, you need an alternative. You need a good activity to bring them back out. And it's not going to bring them back out the first time. It's going to take a little while. Mm-hmm. Mm hmm. It's a, that building up of, of trust. We, we also had some questions about um, parents who have tried the, the strategy that you spoke about um, validating emotions, you know, when they're in an emotional state and they say their um, teens are distrustful. They don't believe that they are truly um, uh, understanding that that's some kind of a trap. Right. So. Okay. <laughs> But that hinges on um, relationship building, yes, in the same the same yeah. vein. Yeah, like my first question is, has that ever been a trap? Because if it has, that there's your problem, right? Um, but if it hasn't, if it's just like teen paranoia, which is a thing, like that's part of the pushing away from mom and dad, which they're supposed to do, like that's developmentally appropriate and also wicked hard during COVID. And, and also there's a level of like, you can't just be like, hey, are, how are you doing? Are you okay? Because obviously they're not right now. No one's okay right now during COVID. So it's going to feel like a trap if you're asking a question that the answer to which is really obvious, right? And it'll feel less like a trap if you reframe it. So if you were to say like, hey, I'm feeling like, like COVID sucks, right? Like I'm bothered by it. This is the stuff that's making me cranky, and I know you've noticed. So I just want to own my stuff. And while I'm owning my stuff, how's your stuff going? Does that make sense? Yes. We had a number of people who asked about if they mess up, if they do yell, if they do swear, um, what's the best way to handle that? So I think you just answered that question. Apologize. Yeah. yeah. Own your stuff. Apologize. Even if it's not till the next day or a week later, like apologize. Mm. Um. You and I've done that, by the way. I've like within the last week, I've done that. So, <laughs> me too. <laughs> me too. We're uh, yeah, we're here on snow day number two, um, ourselves. So, um, a number of people you you kind of prefaced all the in you know, the relationship building on, um, and you mentioned earlier the adventures and the alternatives to screen time. I will say, mm -hmm. people are. Uh, pretty desperate for ideas. So not to place it all in Go your lap. Board game. Oh, no, put sorry. it on my lap. Okay. All the time. I got content for days. <laughs> Go. Um, co cooperative board games. And and I, I don't have a link that I can throw at you and I apologize for that. But if you Google like top 20 cooperative board games, that's going to be good, right? Because cooperative board games, the way they work is it's kind of like a video game. It's you and whoever's playing with you versus the game. And there's mechanics in the game that, like, change how the game is playing based on whether you're succeeding or failing and that kind of stuff. And if you mess up, you just play again. But there's, there's cooperative board games that are one-shots. My, my family and I, we're playing a game called Mice and Mystics right now. It's a cooperative board game. It's kind of a pricey one, I'll admit. But it's like a, it's like an extended storyline where you're playing, like, these people who got turned into mice and they're trying to escape from an evil wizard and all this kind of stuff. And, and – 
you go through different chapters of like a storybook and that's how the game progresses and you get different materials and powers and all this kind of stuff. It's great. And it, it's all done for you. You don't have to make up the story or anything. And there, there's other board games that work kind of similarly. There's like games like, um, there's a bunch of different ones called Panic. So it's like Zombie Panic, Castle Panic, where you're defending something against the oncoming zombie horde or whatever. Those are good. Um, there's a lot of really good cooperative board games out there that I highly recommend playing. It's a way to get an alternative. And it's also a lot of them are close enough to video games that you can kind of tempt your kid into playing it with you. <laughs> um, that's amazing. We will... Um... We'll add these that you mentioned to the webinar page. Um, so when y'all get your email after the fact here, um, we'll, we'll include some links to these games that Brendan yeah. mentioned. And, so you're not scribbling I can, down wildly. Yeah, please. And if I can just plug a buddy, Stephen Dutzman of um, Engaged Family Gaming. Engaged Family Gaming is a great resource for all of this stuff. He's been on the podcast. Um, it, it's, it's his stuff is video games and board games. It's all of these really great games to play with your family that are, and it's a, it's a great resource, great place to go looking. Um, and, and some of you who know who I am, I'm a big Dungeons and Dragons player. If that's, if you've ever done that game, that game is great. My kids have are keeping their social connections because I run a weekly D and D game for them. I've got a weekly D and D game I run with six, six, 11 year olds and 12 year olds just to keep them connected to each other during this time. So there's lots of ways to use games to foster social connection. That's, um, that's awesome that you're doing that. My, um, my kids actually learned it during the pandemic as well. I have a 13 and 11 year old and they took a, um, an online course on the basics of D and D and they were able to play with their cousins, um, you know, five States away. So, um, yeah. and someone else posted here, um, I'll follow up with you. I won't say your name for privacy, but that they own a board game store and they have tons of great ideas for board games. So um, expect an email from, from attitude because um, obviously this is a high demand. So um, we're just about out of time, but the obvious next question that I have to ask is how do you induce your kids to get off the video games and to actually interact with you? the parent. Are you trying? That's my first question, right? Because there's a lot of parents that I work with who are like, I just want my kid to stop playing video games. And I'm like, okay, well, what are you giving them as an alternative? And they're like, nothing. They could read a book or do their homework. Why would I want to do that? Like, I'm going to play my video games, right? If, if you're not making a concerted effort to giving them a better alternative, then they're going to keep playing video games. So you've got to find a better alternative, and that looks like cooperative board games. That looks like adventures, right? Go to Atlas Obscura, which is a website. Go to, like, weird United States. Um, go to only in your state. These are all websites that have cool, wacky, crazy locations in your area that you can go and take a hike at, take a look at, go and do, right? Because stuff kind of has to be outside right now. So those are great resources to find the cool things in your area. For us, we found an abandoned railway tunnel. That's, it's amazing. Like we walked through this tunnel and it's just pitch black for like 10 minutes. Like it's a really long tunnel. And it's so the, the end of it was so far away, it looked white. And then as I got closer, it, it was like walking into a fairy realm. Like it was green and there's all this overgrown plants climbing up the walls and stuff. And there's mud everywhere because it had rained. Like, it was a really cool experience for me and my boys to hike through this tunnel that was just dark. And there's lots of places kind of like that throughout the country. You just have to find them. You have to go looking on websites to figure out where they are. And That's... then keep a Google Doc with all of them on it. <laughs> uh, Atlas Obscura and only in your state. We'll, we'll add those for sure as well to the list. A lot of people are, are eating this up. The, what, tons of comments. Geocaching is another um, suggestion posted here. Make a scavenger so. hunt for your kids. Yeah. Make a scavenger hunt for your kids. Where they, I've done this twice, where they're like, there's a clue that leads them to another clue somewhere in the neighborhood or in the area that you're doing the scavenger hunt, and they find that next clue, and that clue leads to another clue, and you can use maps, you can use code breaking, you can use riddles, 
there's lots of ways to vary the clues, and then at the end they find something that's good. Like I, the first time I did it, it was a box of Legos and candy, and the second time I did it, I spent forty dollars and got uh, I got twenty dollars in gold dollar coins and twenty dollars in quarters, and I dropped them all in like a leather pouch. So they literally found treasure at the end of it. <laughs> like those kinds of things can work too. I love these creative ideas. So uh, unfortunately, I feel like we could talk for another hour at least, but we are out of time today. Um, this was a very helpful, illuminating, and somewhat comforting session. Um, a lot of parents, I think, are feeling less alone in their struggles and now have some new ideas. So um, Brendan, thank you so much for your time and your insight. And absolutely, please um, follow the link on the webinar page everyone to check out um, Brendan's podcast, which is chock full of more of these great ideas. And while you're there, also um, have a look at some of Attitude's other upcoming webinars. We have them just about uh, weekly and they are all free. And the next one um, is about opposition, I'm sorry, OCD uh, and the ADHD link. Um, we had a couple of people here asking about oppositional defiant disorder, and we, we do have a webinar coming up um, on ODD uh, later in the winter. So um, that is March 2nd. Sorry, March 2nd. Uh, so thank you all for joining us. Thank you for being part of this webinar series. Brendan, thank you again. And best thank of you. luck to everyone as we navigate through oncoming challenges. Cool. Thanks.